everyone. Welcome to today's Just Chops In podcast. And with David and myself, we have Jeff Collins. And Jeff Collins is a radio DJ, a bit like me sometimes. <laughs> and uh, an author, but I can't write for shit, so uh, I'm not very good at writing. But um, yeah, you've got a, a book out called Legends of Rockfield. Uh, yeah, Rock Legends at uh, Rockfield, yeah. Oh, Rock, oh, excuse me. See, I can't read very well either. Rock <laughs> Legends at Rockfield. Um, but I've read, actually, there's an, uh, it's an updated version of your published, already published book that was out in 2007. That's that... right, yeah. I did, we, we did a book in 2007 because, you know, as, as a kid, I was always intrigued uh, living in Cardiff as to why bands like Queen and Rush and Judas Priest, you know, uh, would all come to... South Wales would all come to a little rainy farm in Monmouth when they could be in Florida or the Bahamas recording. <laughs> but they would come here like Queen came here to do Bohemian Rhapsody. And I was just, it's just it's astounded me. So, um, yeah, I did a book on why these bands chose South Wales, chose this particular studio to make all those iconic records. And then um, I, I got a call last October from my publisher, the University of Wales Press. He said, look, it's, it's our centenary uh, in 2022. Um, we're going to put out five new books on this new sort of publishing arm we have. Um, and we'd like you to update your book. So I just I added a few chapters, four or five new chapters, added some new photos, and um, yeah, we, and, and they've sort of redesigned the cover and done a really good job, I think. Ah, oh, right, okay. Because I've also read that it includes interviews and uh, obviously you said photographs. Yeah, we, we, one of the things, I've spent 30 years as a newsreader and reporter on local radio and TV, you know, like Sky and ITN and LBC and BBC World. So one of the things that I, I like to do um, I will only include quotes in the book. You know, I, I have to have spoken to the people. I don't, I don't like. I know. I know. Uh, kind of acquaintance of mine once had a book deal where he got to write some biographies, but they didn't need him to interview anybody. He just had to scour the internet and cut and paste interviews from newspapers. But but sometimes things get misunderstood or misquoted. So um, yes, yeah, so I, I actually tracked down all these people like Robert Plant and Geddy Lee from Rush, and we, we interviewed them. And and obviously sometimes people in the bands. Are a bit protective, obviously, of their reputation, what they do. So we'd also speak to their roadies and the engineers and the photographers who followed them. So, so yeah, I spoke to a load of people to to get the stories. Uh, and again, it's, it's not a very, it's not a sort of a dry history of how albums were recorded. It's quite funny. It's all about the food fights and the practical jokes, and, you know, particularly involving Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's known for crashing a quad or two, I suppose. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, the things he gets up to, you know, has, has some of the some of the stories. Uh, there was, I think, the one that always stuck in my mind is one of the roadies uh, with Black Sabbath when they're in Monmouth recording. Um, said one day he he just went out for a stroll because it's in a nice rural area, and he just saw Ozzy running up the pathway by the stream, shouting and swearing. He's trying to kill me. He's effing trying to kill me. He's thinking, what's what's going on here? And it was a swan. This swan had spooked <laughs> Ozzy, and he was fleeing this swan, and because he owns a, a cause at the time obviously Sabbath were very wealthy and selling loads of records because he owned a massive country mansion people like Keith Moon people like him they, they consider themselves country landowners and country landowners have to carry a gun so he, he ran to his car and in his car he keeps a shotgun in the boots as you do being a country landowner and then he turned around now emboldened by the shotgun and decides to take pot shots at the swan that is trying to kill him the swan luckily managed to ev evade this and get back into the water um but yeah the prince of darkness spooked by a swan i just remember the road he's saying i just wondered i thought this might be a gang of you know the, the mafia or there were some triads after him but no it's just this little swan <laughs> well it's a bit yin and yang really isn't it? i mean you got like i said you got the prince of darkness but then he's been chased by this big white angelic <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there we go. Who needs the Bible? You've got that crystallized in one story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. So, what, um, like you said, you were on a radio. What radio show were you on? <clears throat> well, I started off early in my career. I was, I was, I was mainly a newsreader. So, I used to work on um, <clears throat> stations in the Midlands like BRB and Mercia Sound in Coventry. And I used to read the news. And then I joined Classic FM as a newsreader and LBC. Um, and then I changed tack. I came back home to Wales to present sport on TV. So I presented uh, football and rugby on BBC Wales TV for a while. Uh, then I was on Nation Radio doing some news and also doing sports and uh, rugby and football shows, uh, which we won a Sony Award for, for our Rugby Nation show, yeah. which was great. And um, 
Yeah, and then I ended up doing a rock show on Sunshine. So I've been doing a rock show for 15 years. I did it on Sunshine Radio, which was the last ever FM station in the UK. After that, it was DAB only. And more recently on um, Hard Rock Hell Radio, a radio station started up by the guys. They do all these festivals. They've got about 12 festivals all around Europe called Hard Rock Blues or, you know, Hard Rock AOR. And so we we do a sort of I do a weekly radio show, weekly rock show for them. Okay, is that, is that the ones that have been getting some bad press lately? HRH, Dave. Well, they haven't been uh, paying their artists, and uh... yeah, we did have did see something about that, didn't we? Yeah, yeah I saw it. Yeah. I've seen it plastered all over Facebook. Uh, the one in Birmingham, I think, up around that way, has just been a load of art. A load of artists have just pulled out because, uh, yeah. Apparently they treat the artists really badly, but I mean I know David knows. Does John Norman work for HRH? No, no. Oh, he work, who does he work for? Oh, Planet, Planet Rock. Rock. Oh. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's been some controversy with uh, the HRH festivals. But I don't know if you know anything about that, do you? Um, no, no, I haven't come across anything. I mean, we, we're kind of the radio army. We do we do the shows. I mean, we, we attend a lot of the festivals, yeah. uh, as as many as we can. I mean, I, I love festivals anyway. I'm always at uh, either Bloodstock or Steelhouse in uh, South Wales or, you know, Download, you know. So there's there's so many good rock festivals in the UK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're quite lucky, aren't we? I just come back from Winter's End now. That was good. Uh, for the, yeah. I, I was there on the Saturday for the um, the Von Herzen brothers. I know the Von oh, Herzen okay. brothers quite well. I've known Miko, the singer, for got back. 11, 12 years now, because yeah. they headlined the Saturday, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I didn't catch Chris. It was Chris Barris on Sunday, wasn't it? But uh, Yeah, he's awesome. Absolutely yeah, awesome. He is very Mr. good. Chris. Really, really good. Yeah, it was a good show, and I, I quite like it in Treco Bay as well. They, you know, it's pretty, they got it sort of like set out pretty well now, I think, because yeah. of um, Planet Rockstock. You know, they've learned from that, and then it worked for Winter's End as well. But um, yeah, I've already got my tickets for, for Steelhouse. Can't wait for that. Oh, no, I love- line up this year. Yeah, I, lo- I love Steelhouse. And yeah, A- Airborne and Blackstone Chair is the headliners. That's amazing. Yeah, and, um, yeah they're, they're great festivals. But like I said, the, the indoor ones, like Windows End, where you go to those caravan parks and you get to stay for the weekend, have a load of beers, <laughs> yeah, all day music. Uh, they're, they're just brilliant. I love those, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Really good, isn't it? So how how did you get into broadcasting and stuff? Is that, was, is that something that you wanted to do as a as a kid growing up or oh, just I, I, fall into it or...? No, absolutely. When I was a kid, for some, <laughs> for some reason, I was a big news junkie. I used to love news, and I, so I wanted to. But you know, being a working class kid from Cardiff, I just I, I aimed to work on newspapers, and that was my initial plan. And um, I just assumed, you know, it was kind of ironic actually. I kind of assumed you needed to be at Oxford or Cambridge to get into broadcasting. And um, but my next door neighbour in Cardiff at the time was a senior journalist on Red Dragon Radio, which was C- Capital FM now. It was called Red Dragon then. And um, he took me into the station one day, and um, then I ended up. Uh, my my dad used to have a butcher shop in Cardiff, and one of his customers uh, was Vincent Kane. You know, he had that radio show for decades, Meat for Lunch with Vincent Kane on BBC Wales. So, um, and uh, I was his producer, Martin Ingram, uh, who, who his mum was a customer, and so I got an attachment going in there, and I, I just realised actually radio was quite fun. So uh, I went to college. Uh, just to do a general history and English degree. But when I finished, I did a postgraduate in radio journalism and I had to be a newsreader and had to, you know, interview people. And, um, yeah, ended up joining a radio station in Coventry in about 89 and I uh, just started being a newsreader and, and oh, reporter okay. from there. It was just, I, I love news. And, um, you know, as a kid, I mean, I used to love, ITN was my favourite news channel. It's sort of Trevor McDonald and ITN. And, you know, that was my dream. When I, I got to work at ITN for about two or three years. Um, and on Channel 4, I did, I, I spend a lot of time doing the news for the big breakfast. Remember the big breakfast? Yeah. So, <laughs> the, the, my, one of my proudest moments in my career, I, do, I used to do, um, it's very hard. For, when Phil Gale used to present the news, he used to have a little three word strap line above his shoulder. And it had to be something clever, you know, like, like the Sun uh, sub editors did. And and my favorite one, it was, uh, I was there when Glenn Hoddle quit as England manager. And I spent ages thinking, what can I, what can I put above Phil Gale's shoulder? What can I write? And, about Glenn Hoddle quitting the England job. And in the end, I put um, I've Hod enough. And I was so proud of that. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's little things, you know. I've Hod enough. Yeah, that made my day. That did. Put there go. <laughs> I didn't realize you needed a qualification to interview people, Dave. Well, that's, I think we definitely need to do something about that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's where we're going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I can see I've seen from your Facebook and everything. Then, obviously, when you were doing the the rugby show, you're a massive sports fan. Oh, man. So, um, with uh, rugby and football, Cardiff City fan, you? Oh well, yeah, life, yeah, lifelong Cardiff fan and Cardiff rugby fan. Because I'm from Cardiff, so you know, it, it's just that affinity you have for your home team. Sometimes I don't get why. If someone says, oh, you know, my dad grew up supporting Arsenal, I kind of get it. But I don't understand sometimes why people, you know, from Swindon will support Man United. Why don't they support Swindon? You can always have a second team in the Premier League. But, uh, yeah, I've grown up supporting Cardiff rugby and football. And um, as I said, I came, it was great. I, cause I did my first 10 years in news. And then I came back to BBC Wales to do sport. And I, I was there for about eight years presenting sport on BBC Wales. I got the job on Nation Radio. Um, um it was great because we had, we had two shows, Football Nation, which went out on a Friday. It was an hour-long show all about Cardiff City, Swansea and Newport, which we get. It was very hard to get footballers in, so we, we got journalists. I had Chris Wathen, who at the time was on the Western Mail. He's now with the BBC. He, he was the Swansea guy. And then Steve Tucker, the uh, football correspondent for the Echo, he was the Cardiff City guy. So they'd come in and you know, we used to have humorous quizzes. And it was that was quite a fun show to do. And then with Sean Holly, the former Ospreys coach and Scrum Five presenter, me and him presented Rugby Nation. That's what we won the the Sony Award for. Yeah, that's cool, huh? We got bronze. We were beaten un- rather unfairly, I thought, because our show had no budget and was put together in between news bulletins. Uh, and me and Sean would would would, would do it. Um, but we were beaten to the gold uh, award by um, BBC Radio Five Live's whole Olympic coverage, which I thought oh, was right. Right. yeah. We're going to get beaten by somebody, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> And I really enjoyed as well. I spent um, 16 years, pretty much every Saturday, working on Soccer Saturday on Sky Sports News, um, where they would send us around to various games in the Championship, League One, League Two, to uh, to report on um, the games, you know, live, which I really enjoyed. You're getting paid to report live on football. It's just mm. amazing. I, I would have done it for free, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As they probably do nowadays, I guess. <laughs> well, all social media. Everybody wants to be a social media star. So there's all these people doing stuff for free, in there. Well, yeah. a bit like us, Dave, I suppose. Yeah. You know, we do this for free. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always love it whenever they say, you know, people posting on Twitter and Facebook, you're all broadcasters now. Be careful if you libel someone, you're all broadcasters. Uh, which, yeah, inc- incredible thought. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, like I said, I mean, there's so many podcasts and. I uh, mean, internet radio is massive as well, so... Um... Yeah, I think about two years ago, because, you know, that Hard Rock Hell radio work, and that's an internet station. And I think about two, three years ago, for the first time ever, internet listening, internet radio listening worldwide overtook FM and DAB. Um, you know, obviously, as more and more people go online and listen, it, 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 it um, yeah, it exceeded it for the first time, which was you know, incredible. Yeah, well, the thing is, I, I suppose FM radio is quite expensive, isn't it? <clears throat> Yeah, and DAB as well, and also the reach and the signal, you know, whereas I guess with internet listening, as long as you're home or at work or somewhere with a with a Wi-Fi signal, mm. you know, you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and there's so many apps pop up where you can just go on an app and pick your favourite radio station, you know. So, yeah, it's quite easy, really, to listen to whatever you want to listen to nowadays. You don't have to be stuck. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I wanted to listen to Radio Luxembourg, for example, in my bedroom, you know, on my little transistor radio, under the quilt, so my mum, uh, my mum wouldn't know. You know what I mean? It's like we're a far, far cry from that, aren't we? Well, that's it now. Any little niche genre of music you could name will have a million dedicated radio stations to it. You know, yeah, if you yeah. hunt them out, which is which yeah. is incredible. You know, which as you say, we only had the four or five radio stations. And I, I was telling my my son the other day, you know, about how. Uh, when I grew up, you know, we only had the three TV channels. Yeah, and yeah. It was a big thing when Channel Four came. Now, I remember when I was about sixteen, seventeen. Um, I, I still had a few A levels to do, so my parents went on holiday, and I stayed at home. And we got some friends round with some beers because ITV was going twenty four hours for the first time up until then. Course, I'd be stopped. The BBC stopped. If you remember, they used to play the national anthem on the BBC. Yeah, that's right. When it stopped yeah. at midnight, which which I thought was hysterical. But it was great. ITV went 24 hours, and we were just sitting there, and there was some dreadful American sitcom, and there was a really horrific American B movie on. But we didn't care. We were just sitting there going, oh, my God, it's 3 a.m., and we're watching TV. <laughs> it's like, such a big thing. Yeah. You know, technology is weird. And I, because I remember my dad once, you know, when TV's... You know, back in the day, they were big, huge, cumbersome things, weren't they? And you, mm. you couldn't go to a shop to get them. You went to these TV shops and they would bring them round to you. 
you know, yeah. either rented them or bought them. And I remember when we had, when I was about eight or nine, when this TV came around and the salesman came in and he looked at my dad and said, uh, we've got this fantastic new invention from America. It's going to revolutionize TV watching. It's called a remote control. And then you <laughs> don't have to get up and change the TV channel. You can do it from your sofa. My dad just looked at him like he's mad and said, what do you mean, get up and change the channels? I've got kids. If I want to change the channel, <laughs> yes, you on. Ian, you be on. And this poor salesman's face just collapsed as he realised. Devastated. My dad was like, why would I need that? Yeah. yeah. Or you can just get a big stick. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's there's it. only like three buttons on it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need batteries for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was just really quick. If you, if you weren't happy with what was on BBC One, wouldn't take you long to find out. Well, what's it, what else is on? Okay, nothing. Okay, nothing. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he didn't have so much channel up in the news. Oh. For sure, yeah. Well, if you were so, really yeah. lucky, I mean, like you're saying about these TVs were massive. I mean, I had one in my bedroom and, uh, when I was a kid. And if you were really lucky and you could wiggle the aerial about a bit, you could pick up Westwood or, you know, some sort of regional programming. And then uh, you could watch like something that you wouldn't usually watch. Usually it was like a late night horror horror movie or something. Yeah. And it was like, oh yeah, we've got to try and get Westwood today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny old days. I mean, kids. Well, they wouldn't. Really, I mean, look at the, look at the things that have been invented in the last well, sixty years. I suppose. Well, I was going to say, I, I from my days of reporting, I would say, you know, there's been more technological change in the last 10, 15 years than in the previous 400. And yeah. it's weird how, again, telling my, my boy who's 18 now, but, you know, when he's about 12, 13, trying to explain to him that until I was 14 years old, I couldn't walk around with music. You had to sit yeah. stationary in front of a record player. And then the Walkman came out. The cassette well, I don't know, because we had, I, like I said, I, I had a little transistor radio. Ah, yeah. You know? Or yeah, yeah. I yeah. actually had a, a little cassette machine as well. Yeah. Yeah, the ghetto, the... ghetto like, blaster I did when I was 14, 15, yeah. I think, as well. Yeah, they came a bit later, didn't they? But you, yeah. had, a, you had them. Remember them little cassette players that you used to have with the buttons on? Yeah. Oh, yeah, know. yeah. That was my first. That was, yeah, that was my first yeah. thing. I was, yeah. And I, that was like, uh, you had your transistor radios. Then you had your little cassette machines, and then <laughs> came the Walkmans. As transistor well. radios were, were amazing. I mean, funny. I remember I met a guy who had a transistor radio. Um, it must be about six, seven years ago. Um, I'd gone to a Cardiff City game. It was a pre-season game. Uh, I can't remember Cardiff, some Cardiff at Atalanta, some low-ranking Italian team at the time. Uh, and it was it was at the old Ninian Park. It must be more than ten years ago. It was at the old Ninian Park. Mm. And um, this guy was. Me and my friends were standing next to this guy who was in a, a morning suit. And, and, and so was his friend. They were both in the, 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 the top hat and the morning suit. And we thought they must have been doing some kind of charity thing, you know, dressed up in the... Because it was, it was August. It was boiling hot. And they're in this full morning suit. And we thought it must be some kind of charity thing. So we said to him, oh, you know, what are you raising money for? And the guy said, oh, we're not. I'm getting married, he said. I'm getting married down the road. But my wife's let me come... Well, my wife-to-be has let me come to watch the first half. So we said, well, you're leaving. He said, yeah, we're leaving at half time." Oh, so you're going to miss the rest of the game then? He said, no, no, no. I've got a transistor radio in my pocket, a little ear earpiece. I'll be listening as I go down the aisle. And that's what he did. As he went down the aisle, he was listening to radio commentary of Cardiff. <laughs> 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 yeah, they were great, those little radios, weren't they? Yeah, now I had a little earpiece thing as well. And it was like a little army-style green thing, you know? Yeah. Like most of them probably were, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. that's it. I didn't have my first Walkman until I was 17, I think I was, when I had that. So I was in, I'm sure I was in a sixth form. And I used to be listening to Iron Maiden when I was supposed to be doing work. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, old, I must have been like 13, I think. We had to get out of the catalogue because I couldn't afford to buy one. I had a paper round at the time. And it was like this uh, Walk, Sony Walkman, maybe, or maybe a, like a different brand. But I think it was like about 65 quid at a time. Yeah, you know, and pay it off, yeah. pay it off like five or a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so I, expensive. Iowa, mine was an Iowa brand. Uh, remember that? I remember the, the ones that didn't work initially. I remember getting one of the early Walkman CD players. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jumping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They weren't very stable, were they? <laughs> well, I, I even had one where I I had the the Walkman, then it got fitted onto a thing for in the car, and then I had like a pretend cassette thing that you plugged into your cassette player in your car so you could play your CD music through it. And I was the same, that would skip. 
yeah. the minute you go, especially like I live in Cumbran, and there's roundabouts and speed bumps and terrible roads, and it just skipped constantly. It was an absolute nightmare, a waste of time, really. The funny thing yeah. about CDs, I remember watching Tomorrow's World when CDs were first coming out, <clears throat> coming out in the late 80s, early 90s. And do you remember, I don't know if you remember that, they, they did this all over the newspapers as well, where they would like, ah, oh, CDs will play. They're indestructible. They'll play with anything. Look, we, we're smearing this CD in jam, but it'll still play. No, it won't. No, that's right. <laughs> all the time, there's this kind of ridiculous thing with it. Well, yeah, we, now we're putting Marmite on it, but it'll still play. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. A little oh, tiny finger yeah. smudge. <laughs> they put dire straits on it and still played, so uh, you know, play anything. <laughs> that was one of my very first cassettes, I was. Brothers at Arms. So I think I stole it <laughs> off my dad. <laughs> well, that was that sort of like launched Dire Straits, really, didn't it? Because it was like one of the first CDs. Yeah, yeah. You know, that it was, was definitely one six. of the first videos on MTV, wasn't it? Money for nothing. I was one of the very early ones. I remember yeah, watching was, that when, yeah, I, yeah. when I was quite young. Well, we go back to your book. <laughs> so we just totally digress there. <laughs> huh. So what other stories you got from your book then, uh, Jeff? Oh gosh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, you yeah, know, there's, there's so many. I mean, it, it was just the whole experience was good. I enjoyed meeting Lemmy, for example. I, I met him backstage at Cardiff University. And it was quite funny. When I first saw him, he was playing a one-armed bandit. And I kind of said to him, ah, oh, you know, are you winning? And he said, no, of course not. It's my money. <laughs> <laughs> we just enjoyed playing one-armed bandits. And on his yeah, ride, did, yeah. you know, the, the, the rider they have, you know, get us egg sandwiches and this drink. The main thing that he had on every motorhead bill uh, were Kinder Eggs. He loved Kinder Eggs. So there'd be this huge stack of Kinder Eggs backstage all the time. But, the, but the, I remember the, that interview was quite memorable because uh, he'd been at Rockfield Studios with both Hawkwind and Motorhead. And so I had double the questions for him. Uh, but he insisted that we drank a shot, a shot of Jack Daniels uh, after, every, after every question. <laughs> so by question 29, I was suddenly wondering why there were two Motorhead singers in front of me. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, that was really good. And then we, we spent the day with Robert Plant as well. I remember trying to track Robert Plant down, the Ze former Zeppelin singer. He, he did his first four solo albums. Uh, at Rockfield, um, and Phil Collins was his drummer. Um, F Phil was in America doing Tarzan, so he just sent me some. Uh, he sent me an email message to read out to the band, and I remember that being quite funny because I, I read it out. I said, "Look, I've got a message from Phil Collins," which was really, really surreal. Because if you'd told a thirteen-year-old me watching Top of the Pops that one day Phil Collins would ask me to read a message out to Robert Plant, <laughs> I'd be like, "Hey, hold on a sec." Mm. But uh, so I read out this message saying, you know, uh, Phil Collins was saying, hey, I really enjoyed being with you. It was a fun time. Love being with the band. And I just, it made me chuckle. Robert Plant just looked at me and said, well, of course Phil Collins enjoyed playing with us. He was in Genesis, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and there, was, there, was, and one, there was another story, which actually isn't, fully, isn't in the book. It was in a, we did it on a ratio. Of, um, I was interviewing Fish from Marillion. Yeah. And because uh, Robert Plant liked Monmouth so much, he actually ended up living there for a while. Um, and some people didn't recognize him. I remember uh, Carol Decker from Tapau kept meeting him in Victoria Wine in Monmouth and wasn't a big Zeppelin fan, didn't know it was Robert Plant. She just thought he was an, a bloke who liked wine in a chat until right. a friend came into Victoria Wine with him and said, You know, that's Robert Plant from Zeppelin, don't you? But um, he, he lived in Monmouth. And I'll, I'll never forget once. Um, the bizarre thing was, Rockfield's on one side of Monmouth, and then you, you come out of you 10, 15 minute walk down the road, you come to the Mono Bridge at the mm. bottom of Monmouth. And there's like a million pubs there, but all the musicians, for some inexplicable reason, walk, you know, they've they just walked from the studio, they're dead thirsty. They walk past these pubs to the back of the town, to the Nag's Head. So what, what Fish was saying, when Marillion were there, they were a bit broke and, um, on their second album, and uh, they fancied a beer or nine. And him and the keyboard player, Mark Kelly, stole a little dinghy from Rockfield, borrowed rather, they borrowed a dinghy from Rockfield. And they thought this is how they'd get down there quickly is they'd put on the river mono and it would go around the corner and there's the nags head and they'd just get out and go and have a drink. But it was only as they were coming around the bend of the river, they realized they didn't have any paddles and they didn't know how to stop. So Mark <laughs> Kelly was like, I've got an idea. And he pulled a pen knife out of his pocket and starts stabbing the dinghy. <laughs> Only when it starts sinking do they realise maybe this isn't a great plan. So they, it, it sunk. They both end up in the river motto. They swim to the shore. They drag themselves up the shore, covered in mud and water. They walk into the nag's head. 
dripping wet, dripping mud and water everywhere. And they say to the barman, you know, you know two pints of lager, please. And uh, yeah, Fish just said, all you could hear then suddenly were these two voices saying, all right, all right. And he turned around and there's Dave Edmonds and Robert Plant propping up the bar. <laughs> just not batting an eye. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, Plant lived there for a long time, you know. So uh, and a lot of musicians who went to Rockford kind of ended up staying there for a while. They they enjoyed that rural area of the place. And f- funny enough, what we were talking about earlier, I remember interviewing Geddy Lee from Rush, you know, the lead singer of Rush. They did their first albums outside Canada there. They did two albums at Rockfield. One day they got bored, and they, while, while the drum was taking so long doing his drum parts, they went to one of the, sto- the sort of little sheds and got some paint out, started painting the window frames because they thought they looked a bit tatty. So they, the owner comes back and sees Rush painting his window frames. But what are their big concerns? They say, because you know, when, when they are laying down long tracks, it's a bit long-winded and people are waiting. Their crew from Canada really struggled in the 70s with the fact we only had three channels. They were used to watching thousands of channels on cable in, in North America. And they used to say it was really rough on our crew because there would be at midnight laying down tracks and all the crew could watch was Open University or Live Darts. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. just drove them, drove them mental, you know? Oh, they could have had some name changes. I mean, that, that fish story could have been a bit more classic. I mean, Robert Plank, just, <laughs> where have you been? And he said, I'll just come out of the river. And he's like, well, oh, you're a fish out of water. <laughs> <laughs> and then he could have, Rush could have changed the name to Brush. <laughs> 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 why why do you why do you think so many sort of top rock artists go to Rockfield then? What what do you think is so special about the place? I think with a lot of things, it's it's fame and success. Fame and success breeds fame and success. So when you when they had their first few hit singles, you know, I Hear You Knocking by Dave Edmonds in the early 70s was six weeks at number one here and number one in America. And then um Paul Carrick with Ace had that song How Long, which was a big mm. hit. And then, of course, straight after it was Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. And once that was a hit, everybody's like, where did Queen do that? We want a piece of that. And a load of bands who went there said, oh, we were trying to capture that Queen vibe. And we wanted to use the desk Queen used. And the piano Freddie Mercury used to, to compose Bohemian Rhapsody is still there with the wine stain he spilt on it. So, yeah, a lot of bands go there just to kind of emulate their success. And, and then as more bands have success... You know, I think there were five number one albums in the 90s in a row from like the Bo Radleys and Ash and Oasis. Uh, and, and once those people start getting success, everybody wants in. And I think mm. that's what sustained it over the years, you know. So, you know, you had Oasis doing Wonderwall there. Coldplay did Yellow there, their first album. And, you know, Yellow, funny enough, that song was directly inspired by Rockfield because obviously where they come from in London, Essex Way, a lot of light pollution. So the story goes that Coldplay were out in the courtyard at Rockfield, look, and they were just looking at the sky, drink, having a few beers, looking up at the sky. And of course, you know, it's rural South Wales, the sky is gleaming, you can see the stars glittering, it's a very bright sky. And the bass player just said, oh my, look at the stars, see how they shine. Oh, and right. Chris said, oh, I'll have that, that'll be the, first, yeah, the opening line. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's weird how things could, you know, uh, inspire records and, uh, you know, the landscape. But yeah, c- certainly the more famous bands recorded there, the more famous, the more other bands wanted to record there and get that success, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, the most of them, to... sorry, Ted, the most of them sort of stay there for a while and do the writing there as well, or is there a combination of some just turn up, they already know, yeah. got in their head what they want and record? It, it depends how the bands work. Some bands like to go in a studio and then write together. Some bands like to turn up in a studio with everything done, so they just have to lay it down. I mean, funny for, for, in the 90s, when everyone started to record at home, because they could, uh, and then it took 10 years for people to realise maybe it didn't sound as good recording at home, and maybe if you could afford a studio, you should do it. Um, one of the things that saved Rockfield uh, in, in that fallow period, when a lot of studios went out of business, um, was the Stone Roses. They stayed there for about 18 months. They went there. They did both <laughs> albums there, and they kind of did one album and then stayed and started work on the second one. And, of course, they're paying, you know, God knows how much for that studio per month. And they were there for 18 months paying, you know, to get both studios. So that kept them afloat, you know, definitely. Yeah. Um, and of course they had one of their most memorable moments, their Stone Roses. Do you remember they, just as they were starting the second album, they had that dispute with their old record company because they'd left the smaller record company, joined a bigger record company. And the smaller record company, wanting to cash in on the success of the first Roses album, released a kind of compilation of some of the stuff they'd done for them without the band's permission. Mm-hmm. But they were okay. in the contract to them, so they said we're going to put this out anyway. 
the band were so angry, they drove from Rockfield uh, to the record label offices in the Midlands, uh, splashed all the cars in the car park, all the executive cars with paint, splashed paint all over the buildings, even the record label's girlfriend covered in paint, um, and they smashed up some of the cars as well, drove back to Rockfield, covered in paint, tumbled into the studio. The producer, John Leck, had been like, they disappeared for the day, wondered where they'd gone. When they came back in paint and covered in paint and told him what they'd done, he realised the police would be there very soon to arrest them. Quickly, you know, we, we need a single to go out next week. Let's quickly record two songs. So they quickly laid two songs down. And just as they finished, the police turned up, arrested the Stone Roses and took them to uh, jail in the Midlands. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> But they just finished the single, so that was able to be released the next week. So that was good. But, but yeah, people yeah, saying he said I had my he said I knew I needed to get them motoring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah, because they're going to be in all the press. Yeah, you know, so they need that record out like, a asap. So uh, yeah, yeah, some great stories there from Rockfield. I uh, see so you wrote another book as well. You wrote a book about Stuart Cable. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> I I got to know Stuart uh, quite well, um, and. The idea I had for the book um, was not not so much a biography of him. I, I always found as a kid when I was reading biographies, uh, whether it be Cary Grant or you know Robert Plant or whatever it was, I was never really interested in them being at school or whatever because I, I'd been to school. I've done that. Mm. I wanted to know what was different. You know, what was it like being backstage at a Hollywood movie? You know, meeting all these stars. You want to know what the things like you don't normally see. So I didn't want to do a biography with Stuart. So what, what we did, he just formed a new band called Killing for Company. Mm. Uh, and I'd seen them live. And they were really good. They were like a harder version of the Stereophonics. They still have those great catchy choruses. Um, but I thought they were a terrific band. So the, the book was, could he get that band to be as big as the Stereophonics were? And it was that that story. So we, there's a few chapters which deal with the, the fallout of the Stereophonics and how he ended up leaving them and what is, how they started and what his success was like. Uh, but then he was trying to see what the new band could do. So, um, And there was a great set piece in the middle where Stuart knew Roger Daltrey of The Who really, really well because the Stereophonics had helped him with that Teenage Cancer Trust. Yeah. You know. And when The Who played the Liberty Stadium, uh, they got Stuart and the Killing for Company to support them. So we did a l large set piece in the book there. Um, and it was just really good. It was, it was, it was really nice. Stuart, we used to spend ages just chatting about music. He loved music. And um, he, he ended up being quoted in the Rockfield book as well because uh, the Stereophonics had been there. And again, it had been his dream to go to Rockfield because, again, like, like myself, he'd been reading all those album covers as a kid, Queen and all those bands and seeing Made in Rockfield, South Wales, wondering why bands had gone there. And, um, yeah, we just had a great time making it. Um, but then, sa sadly, you know, about a year or two after the book came out, obviously he sadly died, you know, he... Um, uh, yeah, which was really sad, you know. I remember being woken up at five in the morning. Uh, it was Steve Balsama from The Stories uh, rang me and said, oh, God, have you heard, you know, Stuart's died. And uh, I think I spent the rest of the day on on the news, you know, paying tribute to, to Stuart. And it was just a terribly sad time because he was, his son, Kian, was, was, was 10 when he passed away and Stuart was 10 when his dad passed away. And it was just a very, very sad time. Mm. And, you know, he was so young. But, <clears throat> you know, just one of those things. Yeah, 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 really talented guy. Yeah, because we we spoke to well, we're quite friendly with uh, Wendell King Ping, as he's oh, known uh, now, yeah, yeah. and um, obviously he was telling us some stories about what had happened about the band. Because we, me and Terry, didn't really know about the band until we did a bit of research. Because well, before we had Wendell on, and you're right, you know, the music is fantastic. Really, really good music. That that band, very, very good. Uh, yeah, well, I think I think they would have gone a long, long way. You know, it, obviously it had the benefit of Stuart being in the band and pushing it, but I think you know the the sound of the band was big enough to to carry itself anyway. It's brilliant. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I knew Wendell quite well. He, you know, he, he's a great guy. You know, and, and his new band Pearl are brilliant as well. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I think, but the good thing was at the time, um, Killing for Company had just been signed by Nuclear Blast, one of the big heavy rock labels with lots of money, and they were pumping money into the band. And they liked them so much, uh, they invited the band up to be the kind of like house band for their Christmas party, which was like a big, big thing. They, they have loads of big bands like Nightwish and, you know, all that, all, all, all bands like that. So it was a big label. And I, you're right, I, they were so good live and the songwriting was so good. I think they'd have gone really far, definitely. Mm. It, was, it was sad to see that come to a halt, really. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean we like we spoke to Wendell and he said that um that they just they tried to continue after Stuart was gone, but his yeah. his heart wasn't really in it, you know? Because it, it was more about it being <clears throat> Stuart's band than their band. It was difficult. I mean, again, part, part, one of the new chapters in the Rockville book, w there's another studio just down the road from Rockville called Mono Valley. Yeah. And it used to be Rockville's rehearsal studio. And then the, the two brothers who owned the business split, split. And the one brother, Charles Ward, took Mono Valley and Kingsley took Rockfield. And Mono Valley's become a famous studio in its own right, you know, with mm. Simple Minds, Yes, Sabbath, all these famous bands. O Oasis, of course, recorded their album then. The, the famous... Um, Water wheel doors in the studio feature on the cover of that record, and um, <clears throat> that's where Killer for Company recorded some songs. A lot of them didn't make it on the album, um, and I've got some of them on a CD. And it's so sad; these were some of their best songs live. And by the time they did the album, they had newer songs, so they left their classic songs off the album, which is a real shame. And it's one of the best CDs I've got, but it, it, you know, it's, it's not been experienced by many people, sadly, because those songs are so good. But um, Bob Marlett, who's a legendary producer, he's produced you know, Judas Priest and Kiss and Sabbath. And he flew across to, to, to work with King for Company and Stewart at Mono Valley. And um, their singer, Greg Jones, I don't know if Wendell mentioned him much, but Greg, terrific voice, but also such presence on stage. He was such a good performer. And um, we, we did a little piece in the book, in, in the new book on the Mono Valley chapter about Greg and, you know, recording with uh, Bob Marlette and Stuart wandering around, peppering, you know, his stories everywhere. But Bob, yeah, Bob Marley was a big character. And I think as Greg and Wendell both said, you know, to, to work with a producer of that legendary status. And um, and they've all got great stories. I remember we were sitting outside in the courtyard at Mono Valley and Bob Marley was telling us his story. He was in, in a band. I think it was, um, it was either, I can't remember now, it was Riot or Quiet Riot. He's in one of those big metal bands, but it was still early days for them. And they, they, were, they, were not, they were quite poor. And they were playing some gigs in LA and they decided they didn't have any money for hotel rooms. They didn't really have a tour bus. So they'd have to either find a fan or a groupie that they could stay the night with, you know, so, someone they could maybe crash on the floor with or pick up, whichever, whatever was best for them. So Bob Mallett said he met this uh, groupie, this young girl, and she said, look, you know, I'm, I'm a nanny in L.A. and my boss has gone away to Switzerland. We've got a spare room. Come and crash at the spare room. So Bob was like, yeah, cool. Result, I've got a place to stay. So he goes into this house and he, the first thing he thought was this, the, the, her boss must be a massive Beatles fan because there were these bobbleheads of Ringo Starr everywhere. There was a Ringo Starr drum kit, all this Beatles memorabilia. And he's thinking, oh, this guy must be Beatles mad. So he crashes in the spare room for the night and the next day he's woken up by this knocking on the door. And for some reason, I guess the nanny had drunk too much. She wasn't getting up to answer the door. And he thought, oh, I better go and answer. This guy won't, won't stop. Go away. Yeah. So he answers the door and... There's George Harrison. Hello. He says, is Ringo in? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, uh, no, I think he's in Switzerland. Closes the door. <laughs> George Harrison goes, but uh, yeah, I thought it was a great story. But yeah, Bob Mallet, a real character. A real, a real character. <laughs> yeah, I'm lost now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't got many stories like that, have we, Dave? No. No, oh, definitely not. That's unbelievable. But we, you know, we get some good stories from our guests, and uh, but uh, have you got any more future books uh, you're going to write? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I hope so. I mean, we, we're still kind of in the. It's still early days for this book. Uh, yeah. The paperback version's coming out sometime this year. Um, it's being launched in America in April. For some reason, it didn't come out in Europe early in September. And then in America, it's distributed by the University of Chicago Press. So they're putting it out in April. So it kind of gets a second wind uh, okay. in America. So we're going to be pushing that. So, so yeah, maybe by the end of the year, we'll see if the publishers want, you know, hopefully want okay. another, you know, we'll see. Do you do uh, your books on audio books or are they only uh, paperback? Um, they're not on audio, but they're, they're on Kindle. They're, there's an electro and e version, but um, okay. they're not on audio Yet. Uh, I did suggest this to the press because I said, look, you know, you're missing a trick. I'm, you know, I I'm a radio newsroom presenter. I'll voice it up. You'll, you'll say yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was just, just going to say that because you've got a perfect voice. I mean, especially to narrate your own book, you know. Yeah, I was, well, yeah, I was going to say, I could, I, you know, you don't have to pay Daniel Craig. Uh, you know, I, I can do <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, the, so yeah, maybe, in, maybe in the future, I'd like to see that. But uh, we'll see, you know. Yeah, because I know James Kennedy uh, did his own book. He narrated his own book for audio. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And why not if you can? Yeah. You know, I remember 
uh, watching Murder She Wrote. You know, Jessica Fletcher. She's she used to voice her own books in some of those episodes. Yeah, she did. Yeah, <laughs> before about four or five people died during the recording, obviously. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, if you've got some mates, uh, still got some mates at Rockfield, you can nip down there and for a day and just do your own book. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. That's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, sounds like a plan. So, so you've, you've gone. Sorry, <laughs> done a couple of times though. So you've you've sort of met an awful lot of people. Is, is there anybody out there still that you haven't had the opportunity to have a chat with yet and interview? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, you're right. I mean, I've been very lucky because again, being in news, you know, I've been able to meet loads of politicians and business. Yeah, you know, I've, I've I've been lucky enough to interview three prime ministers and uh, people like Neil Kinnock and you know, cabinet ministers and businessmen and uh, actors and actresses. So you, you do get to, I mean, because it's funny, if I remember coming home once, I gave my mum a little present where I'd been to Harrods. It was the, it, uh, bizarrely, for, I don't know why they did this, Harrods. It was the launch of um, James Bond Goldeneye and Piers Brosnan was there and he was doing the interviews at Harrods. So I was working for LBC and I, I interviewed Piers Brosnan and of course they got these deck of cards and he had stacks of them. And so when the interview ended, he said, here, I have a deck of cards. And then, oh, take another one. So I remember giving them to my mum and I, I gave her these cards and said, she just looked at it and went, oh, pack of cards from Harrods, very swish, very nice. And I said, um, do you know whose cards those were? No, that's James Bond's cards. That's what we the Piers Brosnan, which was a nice present. But you, yeah, you do get to meet, uh, I remember meeting Henry Kissinger, you know, who because I used to love politics. I always stay up and watch elections. I love politics. And he was a big hero of mine. But um, it's been good to meet all my musical and sporting. Because, again, doing the rugby and football show, I've got to meet all you know, my music. The big one was Gareth Edwards. As a kid growing up, you know, Gareth Edwards was my total hero, watching Wales in the 70s, always winning, uh, and then having to put up with the 80s and 90s where we never won a game. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, here it comes again, yeah. These things are very cyclical. But remember, I went I went to Toulouse to do a documentary for BBC Wales on Cardiff v Toulouse in the Hunting Cup. We did a special documentary on that. And Gareth Edwards was there, and I, I interviewed him for about the third or fourth time. And and it's funny, just the little things that, that make you, you know, one of the highlights of my career, just the little things. Um, the next week, Cardiff Rugby were doing a press conference, and I went to that. And uh, as I'm walking through into the press conference room, Gareth Edwards is in front of me, and he holds the door open for me and turns around and says, after you, Jeff. And all I could think of was, oh, my God, Gareth Edwards remembered my name. And it was, it was, I, was I don't think I paid attention to the press conference the next 20 minutes. I was sitting there going, bloody hell, Gareth Edwards, knew my name. So you get to meet some great people. The, the, the one person I think I'd like to interview I never have, I was a big, growing up, I was a big ELO fan. I loved ELO. And I could never understand why, whenever people are discussing great singers, they'll all say, oh, Robert Plant or Paul Rogers and, you know, Bon Scott, don't they have great voices? No one ever says Jeff Lynne. Mm -hmm. I think he's got an amazing voice, and he writes all these great songs. I'd love to have interviewed him. He's quite reclusive, so yeah. I never have. Uh, but that's someone I'd still have, you know, if I ever had the chance, I'd love to interview him, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's a pity. Because we've spoken to Bev Bevan. Ah, right, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I met him once. He, he worked on the radio station I was in in Birmingham. Oh, did he? Um, yeah, I met him. He's, he's a lovely guy. But, uh, yeah, nice guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were a great band, ELO. I, I really, really like that band. Yeah, they were. They were amazing. And uh, full credit to uh, Bev, he, he just said that Jeff Lynn's a genius. So He did, yeah. Didn't he? Yeah. So, yeah, he's amazing. So. All right then, mate. Well, thanks for spending some time with us. And uh, we'll look forward to what you've got coming next. I do recognise your voice, actually. Now I've listened to you, it's like, yeah, I, I do, um, do recognise your voice. Mm. We're talking about Sean Holly then. Do you play golf? Uh, no, no. Um... <laughs> And I don't know, yeah, a sport I never got into for some of the, yeah, Sh Sh Sean Holly is, yeah, golf mad. Yeah, yeah, because they're, they're all doing golf now, golf days with uh, one of my mates. So he's uh, oh. organising everything. Mike Jones, a disabled golfer. Yeah. Shout out to him. So, uh, yeah, they're doing good things over there. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, yeah. All right, nice to hear some good stories. Yeah. Well, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me on. It's been, it's been fun. It's been good, good fun. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for coming on, mate. Oh, I mean, thanks for coming on. We like to talk to people. and uh, Yeah, yeah, and I'll see you at the <laughs> hopefully. Oh, yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. I'm bound to run into you at Steelhouse. I, I love that festival, definitely. Yeah, brilliant. We don't have any qualifications for um, interviewing people, but we do our best, don't we, Dave? <laughs> we try. 
<laughs> David usually does all the research and I just do all the puns. <laughs> dad jokes, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're a dad, you're allowed to put a dad joke in, in you. You are, yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's been brilliant speaking to you. Brilliant. And, uh, yeah, we, yeah, hopefully we'll speak to you again. Yeah, any, any time. Brilliant. Right, thanks, mate. Okay, right. take care. Thank you.